Acton TV to be here to film this. Uh, it'll be available both uh, uh, on the regular Acton TV schedule and on demand, and you can access that on demand site through the museum website at discoverymuseums.org if you want to watch this again, or you have friends who couldn't make it here today, we'd love to hear about the event. We're uh, fortunate to be joined by um, uh, Tom Bowden, who's our camp capital campaign chair and, and board member of the museum, and J.D. Cheslock, who's also a board member, who I'm going to be introducing in a second. <coughs> Before we get into uh, the program, though, I'd like to introduce um, our good friend, uh, Dick Main from Enterprise Bank. Enterprise Bank is a premier sponsor, along with Nuance Communications, of the um, speaker series, and I'd like to ask Dick to say hi to everybody. Thank you, Neil. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here together. Um, we look forward to supporting the efforts of Discovery Museum. Our senior management team, Ryan Dunn, Ken Anson, and Wendy Baker, who's on the board, is on vacation. I uh, believe very strongly in what you're doing. We're happy to support it. Uh, from day one, Enterprise goal was to be the biggest, if not the biggest, be the best independent community bank and the last one standing. And we've had a good track run. Our employees from day one get very actively involved in different community events. Uh, they're very passionate about it and they support that. Uh, Enterprise Bank is a $2.6 billion bank. We have an investment advisory group, an insurance operation, uh, residential mortgage center, state-of-the-art cash management, and <coughs> e-banking services. Uh, George Oberhauser will speak today on social enterprise. Uh, we also believe very strongly in that. We take deposits locally and we put them back to work in the community uh, from which we receive them. Looking forward to hearing George's remarks today. Thanks, Dave. It's really you know, such a pleasure to, to work with, with Dick and all the folks at Enterprise Bank. They're enormous supporters of the museum, but also they're just a great uh, group of people to, to work with day in and day out. Um, maybe you love going to the branch where they know your name. <laughs> um, as promised, I will now introduce J.D. Cheslock to introduce our speaker. J.D. is the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Business Roundtable, where he's responsible for developing and implementing the strategic framework and the direction of the Roundtable, which works in many areas, including competitiveness, healthcare, education, transportation, and infrastructure. J.D. has worked in and around Beacon Hill for more than 20 years, in a whole host of positions, too numerous for me to mention. Uh, he joined the Mass Business Roundtable in 2004 after serving as the Legislative and Issues Director for the Early Education for All campaign. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that, that notion today. He was responsible there for de de developing and driving legislative support for an agenda which included the creation of the Massachusetts Department of Early Education and Care. J.D. now serves as the chair of the board of directors for that department. <coughs> In addition to all of those responsibilities, J.D. is the chair of the executive committee of the Governor's STEM Advisory Council. Um, he's a trustee of the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. He also serves on the board of the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education and the advisory board of Writing Nation. All of those things pale, however, in comparison to his role as the father of two daughters and who live in Arlington with his wife and who are members of the Discovery Museum. Uh, I think that's got to be the most important. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome Jane. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Neil. The introduction of the person introducing the speaker should not be that long. But <laughs> thank you, my friend. Um, so I was lucky enough to have met George um, through some national work we do with the Ready Nation, as Neil mentioned. For those of you who don't know, Ready Nation has become the preeminent business organization working to strengthen business and the economy through effective investments in children and youth. This is a key part of the agenda at the roundtable as well. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about the workforce pipeline, particularly with an emphasis on STEM education, as Neil mentioned. 
and the important link between STEM and early childhood education. I've always believed that to have a successful STEM pipeline, investments have to start at the beginning of that pipeline with very young children who are already natural scientists and engineers. That's one of the reasons why I love the Discovery Museum. I'm on the board, they absolutely get that. My girls love it there. If you haven't been there, go there. It's a remarkable, remarkable place. Um, you all have seen George's bio. I'm not gonna repeat it. What was most interesting to me is how he has taken a very, very successful um, career in venture capital and applied those lessons to early childhood education, the nonprofit sector, more broadly and generally for social good. That is what he's been doing for the past decade and he's now a frequent speaker and writer um, on the topic of innovation in the non in nonprofit sector finance. He's the co-founder of Third Sector Capital Partners and in the past has helped countless nonprofits, financial and marketing technology firms and many other new businesses grow and prosper. He also is a founder, a co-founder of Capital One. And as we were talking before, um, before during the coffee time, he told me that he is the guy that actually coined the name Capital One. So if you are sick of the what's in your wallet <laughs> <laughs> advertisements, blame that guy. Um, at that third sector, George focuses on deal construction, rigorous impact evaluation design, and thought leadership. We are thrilled to have such a thought leader with us here today. Please join me in welcoming George Oberholzer. Thank you very much, JD, and for the kind introduction. Uh, you are giving me a small case of post-traumatic stress disorder, <laughs> thinking about Capital One. That was a long time ago. Uh, but uh, in some ways, it, it is good to bring up that topic because it reminds me that the work that we're now doing in the social sector in many ways resembles or is an echo of the work that we did so long ago in the credit card business, of all things. And uh, that was to shift the business model from one that was based um, very heavily on intuition and judgment and to make it a more scientific enterprise. So the story of Capital One was that we were actually a consulting firm and we had a consulting engagement for a little bank in Virginia called Signet Bank. And uh, we advised them, why don't you use computers? There's this new thing called computers. This was back then, they really were a new thing <laughs> in the uh, early 90s. And they said, well, that sounds great, but we don't know how to use them. Why don't you do that? And we said, well, actually, we don't do anything. We're consultants. <laughs> and they said, no, no, why don't you do it anyway? We said, oh, okay. So we got this little division, this little credit card division in, in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, started to use an evaluation approach, randomized control trials. And first we had to learn how to do randomized control trials. What we just discovered very quickly was we didn't have the talent on board to grapple with numbers and to be scientific. So we had to do a lot of hiring and a lot of organizational changes. But eventually we did get to the point where we could do this test and learn approach and we ended up doing uh, 3,000 tests a year, a small percentage of which really worked well at bringing value to new segments out in the credit card world. You know, back then, only 50% only of people were permitted to have a credit card because no one could figure out how to lend productively to, uh, to other folks. Uh, long story short, 15 years later, the entire industry is now using actuarial techniques, test and learn techniques, so that all of their products are empirically proven and reliably empirically proven because that's the thing about actuarial science is that you have the law of large numbers working for you and you have kind of an experimental approach, a laboratory approach almost uh, to rolling out products. So that in really in a very real sense, that's what uh, we've been trying to achieve at Third Sector Capital Partners with this um, pay for success approach and the social impact bond uh, approach that I'll be uh, discussing today. Um, I also wanted to say it's great to be here at iRobot. We were joking uh, earlier about this. This feels just a little bit like the beginning of a thriller in the, in the movie. Uh, you know, you go to that robot firm and you, you give a speech. It will be revealed two-thirds of the way through the speech that, in fact, I am a robot. <laughs> but for now, I'll try to act human. <laughs> 
Um, it also inspired me a little bit to be more nerdy than usual. I'm actually going to begin the talk by discussing the history of the light bulb. That is the light bulb. And you might think that the light bulb, you know, Thomas Edison. It was dark, and then it was light, and it was all Thomas Edison. But in fact, that's not the way innovation really happens. And I found this remarkable chart here on the internet that is showing how many human labor hours it takes to generate a thousand lumens. A thousand lumens is a flashlight, essentially. And what you find is, if it, if it was just all Edison, what you would find is a straight line, and then a plummet, and then another straight line. But in fact, what you see is long and steady progress, and sometimes you go up before you go down. And each one of those dots was another innovation that took place. It was first they had tallow for candles, then they had whale oil for candles, and then someone came up with a lamp that you could put the whale oil in, and then someone came up with kerosene, then someone invented the arc light, and after the arc light came the incandescent bulb, but they, they tested all these different filaments, and on and on and on it went. This long march of progress. In each case, it was not only about coming up with a new innovation, but just as important, it was about having a mechanism to displace the old innovation. And uh, in the world of light, where we've gone from eight hours for a thousand lumens to one ten thousandth of an hour for lumens, there's been tremendous progress as well as a feedback loop, which is the marketplace. Um, so what about more social things? So this is Richard Nixon, as, as if you didn't know. This is him signing the war on cancer. Progress has been made in cancer. But I happen to be reading the Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, David versus Goliath. I don't know if anyone's read that book. But in that book, he describes the story of the war on cancer. And again, notice it's many, many different steps along the way. That's how progress is made. Child leukemia. It started with uh, platelets to keep kids from bleeding to death. Sorry to bring that up, but they, the, the young children were dying too quickly to test drugs. First, they had to stop the bleeding. Then someone came up with a, a drug. It was like chemotherapy, but it was just one drug. Then they, someone else came up with another drug. And then another drug eventually came along. Then finally, someone came up with the idea of making a cocktail of drugs. Then someone else came up with the idea of you can't do it just once. You have to do it repeatedly. And then yet someone else came up with the idea, you've got to get into the bone marrow. And eventually, slowly but surely, eventually, they tackled childhood leukemia through a series of steps. And you get this sense of inexorable progress that takes place if you allow that feedback loop to inform innovation. <coughs> Here's another one. This is the uh, Victorola. This is an early innovation in the Victorola. Don't ask me what this thing is. Can anyone explain this? Those are three needles going on to a single ray. What did that sound like? I think that might have been one of those upticks in the, uh, on that graph. This is a uh, 78 record. This is one of the first tape recorders. Eventually, this became the next tape recorder. Someone came up with the 45. Remember those round discs? People remember that, the uh, older people in the room. Then this breakthrough, the LP, came along. And then the biggest breakthrough of all, the eight-track recorder. We thought we had arrived. And yet, someone did better. They came up with the cassette deck. And the cassette deck brought about the boom box, which made it portable. But someone said, wow, portability? That's cool. Why don't we do the Walkman? That's really portable. Then someone else said, yeah, but it doesn't sound very good. How about digital audio tape? How many people here actually ever use digital audio tape? I did for about a week. <laughs> then the big breakthrough happened. It was the compact disc. And we thought we were done, but we were not done. Along comes this guy and the iPod. And he's not done. Well, unfortunately, he <laughs> was done, but, but the 
the innovation kept on happening. It got smaller and smaller and smaller until finally that little shuffle there, which is about this big, sounds better, stores a whole record collection. It's amazing. That's the way innovation works. It's one thing replacing another, replacing another, a long, steady march. So we're here to talk about education and uh, poverty and things like that. Let's look at that one. How about education? Here's education. Flat. Isn't that interesting? Where's the march? Why is it flat? It's a puzzle. Let's look at poverty. This is Lyndon Johnson. Now he's signing the war on poverty. Is it, did it go as well as Nixon's war on cancer? Sorry, it did not. No progress. So it's, it's an intellectual conundrum. Where's the progress? Everything else has progress. Why don't we have it here? Well, the place to start is Uncle Sam. Here's Uncle Sam. And he's pointing out at us. And he's saying, well, innovation comes from you, the philanthropists. It's got to be private. It's a fund what works world. You innovate, and then we'll roll it on out. And that's kind of the model, the old demonstration grant model. That's, that's the model. Uh, one thing I want to say, though, while we're using nerdy numbers, let's just take a look and ask the question, how much can philanthropists actually accomplish, given that their expenditures are teeny tiny compared to government's expenditures when dealing with the social issues that we all care about. So in government, all of philanthropy, and this is 2012, all of philanthropy directed $41 billion towards education. And by the way, the lion's share of that was going to places like Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and you know, their endowments. So in fact, it's much smaller than that when you're looking at uh, you know, education or for, for younger kids. Uh, a trillion dollars was spent by government on education. So the thought that philanthropy can solve this problem without influencing government profoundly is a very powerful thought. We, mu we cannot address our social problems unless we address them at the scale in which they exist, and only government can do that. That's a, a pretty sobering and profound insight. There's all of welfare. $40 billion from philanthropy went towards welfare, $520 billion of government money. And so when we ask, why is it flat? We're going to need to ask what's going on with government spending because that's where the action is. Even if philanthropy is completely innovative, it's not going to move the needle. So let's look at the translation of innovations into the rollout, which is government, is uh, an insight. Which for me, by the way, having done some philanthropy, I came to philanthropy at the beginning and said, the last thing I want to do is grapple with government. It's really hard work, and let's work with the kids. Uh, but it's, it's only reluctantly when you see a chart like this that you say, you know what, if we're going to address the social problems we care about, we're going to need to actually reinvent the way government is addressing them. Or else accept the flatness that we're seeing in those curves. So what it really ends up being all about is a feedback loop, in my mind. Where is the feedback loop? What is the feedback loop for government? And the way government works, as I've gotten closer to it in, in the education and welfare and poverty areas, has a political feedback loop, and it has an incumbent feedback loop. So let me give an example. 30 years ago, Head Start was conceived of because this spectacular uh, demonstration happened in Ypsilanti, Michigan. It was called the Abecedarian Program. They did a randomized control trial. Amazing results for these kids. And someone said, you know, there ought to be moral imperative. All kids should get Head Start. And indeed, currently, $7 billion a year is spent on Head Start federally. Um, but the other thing they did was to say, we need fidelity to the model. So let's, let's write up what this thing looks like in the form of a law. It looks a little bit like a recipe card. 
and let's say, you know, there ought to be a law, here it is, anyone who follows this recipe card will get reimbursement. But if you don't follow the recipe card, you won't get reimbursed. So everyone, follow this, please, and uh, we'll revisit it from time to time. Uh, but in fact, for the next 30 years, it was the same recipe card. And if people did something different, they didn't get the money, so they had to do that. If they weren't great cooks, that's okay. They said they followed the recipe card. If the recipe needed to change because times changed or we had different populations we were served, well, it didn't change. It's the same recipe card. So that's, that's really kind of at the heart. We don't have that scientific feedback loop. Instead, what we have uh, is a situation where once a law exists, it is extremely difficult because of all the incumbents and all the layer upon layer of apparatus that's built on it, it's very difficult to unseat the innovation that existed. And, uh, so one of the things I want to say, however, is the same thing that happened 15 years ago for Capital One is happening right now in the social world. Uh, we used to joke that social sciences isn't really a science because there's no data. Well, now for the first time, it is a science because for the first time, unbelievably large amounts of data are being thrown off as a byproduct of running government. And they call those administrative databases. But to give you an example, uh, one person I happen to know, he actually used to work at Capital One. He now runs something called the National Student Clearinghouse. He has in one database for every high school student in this country what college that student goes to. The reason he has it is because he's been federally empowered to do so as a way of checking up on federal student loans. But the byproduct of checking up on all these student loans is that we now have a pingable database, if you will, that can ask the question, did this kid who's currently in the sixth grade, let's take a peek seven years from now, did this kid ever go to college? We could never do that before, but now we can and we can do it using the law of large numbers. Another example is a professor at Harvard named Raj Chetty, who uh, he's about 12 years old as far as I can tell. Uh, he just won a MacArthur Genius Award. Now, why did he win this award? Because he, um, he got his hands on detailed data for two million students, younger students, seventh grade, sixth grade, around that. He, he knew who all their teachers were. He knew what all their standard tests were before and after the teacher. He was able to show that a subset of teachers reliably accelerated learning much more than other teachers. He was able to show thousands of times over, because remember, he's working with two million students, thousands of times over that when that teacher went from one school to another, the acceleration stopped at this school and it started in that school. So it is very strong scientific evidence about what these teachers do. But that isn't why he got the Genius Award. The reason he got the Genius Award is he also got his hands on the IRS database of all earnings of all Americans. And I didn't mention this, but his student data was 15 years old. So he was able to ask the question 15 years later, what happened with these kids? He got an 83% match rate. I mean, this is spectacular. From a, if you're into data, that's spectacular. And he was able to show that the kids with those superior teachers, those classrooms earned $200,000 more than the ones without the spectacular teachers. So for the first time, what we're seeing is using real science, there is not only a scientific feedback loop, but a financial feedback loop that can be harnessed to inform policy. Um, so we have an opportunity to apply that feedback loop in a world that currently doesn't know how to use it. And that's our mission, the Third Sector Capital Partners, we're a nonprofit organization. Our mission, if you were to read it, uh, is to accelerate America's transition to a performance-driven social sector. But our strategy is to put in this actuarial feedback loop based on administrative data and to connect money to that. And I'll explain more specifically how that works in just a moment. But first, let's ask the question, you know, what happens if for the first time 
you can kind of open up the oven and look at what the data tells you about the, the um, interventions that are being paid for by government. Now, before I show you this slide, I want to say I am an advocate of social investment. But it pains me to have to share what the returns currently look like. I just want to prepare you psychologically. <laughs> uh, there's a, a fellow, he is a belovedly nerdy person. His name is John Barron. He went to Yale and he decided, I know what I'm going to do with my Yale Law School degree. I'm going to go to Washington and I'm going to establish the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy. That's what I'm going to do with my life. And he did this. He put together a blue ribbon panel of all the best social scientists in the country who understand how very rigorous randomization works, randomized control trials work, <coughs> and, uh, and have reviewed all of the literature. And did you know there are hundreds of millions of dollars spent each year federally running these randomized control trials? And so they reviewed it. Here's what they discovered. Of the 10 whole federal programs evaluated in well-conducted RCTs over 1995 to 2009, nine of them produced weak or no positive effects. And let me explain how this works. You take 2,000 kids who went to Head Start and you compare them to 2,000 kids who didn't go to Head Start randomly. And you ask the question, is there a discernible difference in the statistical profile of this group of kids compared to that group of kids? Did more of these kids go to college? Did more of these kids avoid drugs? Did more of these kids uh, graduate from high school even? And the answer is that nine times out of 10, there's no discernible impact. It's like, oh my goodness. Uh, but don't forget that one time out of 10, there is a discernible impact. And if you, if you pivot this around, it's actually great news. The best possible news for those of us who are worried about how do you pay for all this stuff. Because what it says is that we have no shortage of money. We have 90% of what the feds are spending on stuff like this is just sitting there poised to be reallocated towards the 10% that actually works if we can build this feedback loop. So we don't have a shortage of resources. What we have is uh, the, a system that is unsuccessfully allocating resources towards the programs that work best. In fact, what we have is a system currently, who can, who can tell me what this is a picture of? This is uh, Austin Powers. He is cryogenically frozen. Uh, this, is, this is Dr. Evil. He is also cryogenically frozen. What we have is a system that, because of these recipe laws, it's a fund what once worked system. There ought to be a law that rolls this out. And by the way, I want to say Head Start. Even within Head Start, there are many very effective and proven deliverers of Head Start. So this is not an indictment of Head Start, the, uh, the programmatic approach. This is just a recognition that unless we have greater fidelity to the model, unless we really focus on results, nine times out of 10, we may find that um, the recipe hasn't been adjusted correctly or the chefs aren't cooking it quite right. Uh, so we live in this fun what once worked world. And, you know, I, I like to joke that if, if our social programs were the same as what we used to listen to stuff, we all still be listening to Meatloaf on 8-track recorders. Okay, so that's kind of the opportunity. What are the tools? We have two new tools that at um, Third Sector that we've been experimenting with around the country. One of them is called Pay for Success. And this is, quite simply, it says, we're going to have our contracting with government for social programs be performance-based. 
the government only pays if the needle moves on outcomes. So instead of having government pay for inputs, you know, please follow the recipe, the government says, tell you what, do what you're going to do, we'll take a taste. If it tastes good, you'll get paid. Otherwise, no money for you. Um, government does that type of performance-based contracting in lots of areas, but they've never done it in the social services area because we didn't have social science. But now we do have social science and we can measure what works and what doesn't work, and it becomes possible to do performance-based contracting. Notice that when you pay for outcomes instead of outputs, you relax the constraint that everyone has to follow the recipe in order to be paid. And so that opens up the possibility of investment and in fact it creates an incentive to invest because if someone can move the needle further, they get paid more than others. If they can move the needle the same amount but for less money, they have a margin that comes out of that that they can then reinvest into more research and development. Now there's a problem though that when you do pay for success contracting, in this space, there's something new that happens, which is it takes time to determine whether or not outcomes happen. It might take four years. Who pays for the program then? It used to be you just get reimbursed as you go. Well, now you have to wait four years. You may or may not be paid four years from now, depending on whether you reduced the number of kids going to prison, let's say. So what's required is financing. And that's what this social impact bond is. It's not really a bond, that's a misnomer. It's really just a loan. It's money that you get from philanthropists and banks that pay for programs over a period of time while everyone waits to see if the programs were successful. If they're successful, the government then finally pays and you can pay back those who provided the financing. If the program's not successful, the government never pays and those who put up the financing lose their shirts. But most important from a systemic standpoint is we now do have a feedback loop. It's both scientific and it's financial. You know, people argue we've had scientific feedback for a long time in government. We've been running randomized controlled trials for a long time. And it's true, uh, although they tend to be snapshots instead of movies. But more important, it, it's a system where everyone hires their own PhD and you'll have 10 different studies and one will say one thing and the other will say another and people in government making decisions, you know, in the legislation, legislative bodies, they don't have an ability to really see what's going on. They're confused because, well, your PhD says that and your PhD says that. Look, I'm confused. I'm just going to use my gut. In this system, what you have is banks and philanthropists who put up 15, 18 million dollars and they sign the dotted line on this contract and they say, but we're not going to sign the dotted line unless it is abundantly clear which scientific method is going to be used to measure outcomes. And it has to be um, the gold standard of measuring outcomes. So we're, we're putting a scientific and a financial feedback loop into this and putting in stakeholders who for six, seven years are going to follow this along and even if government, you know, government has a funny way of changing its mind when elections come along and the new crew comes in, they say, well, you know what we said three years ago, I'm, I'm the new person and so I've got something new to do. Well, this thing has stakeholders who stick around who are non-governmental and that, that's also something that's new about this system. So just to walk through how it works mechanically, you raise money, from philanthropists and banks, you deliver the services, you either do or don't receive the government success payments, and then that allows you to replenish the money that you raise. For the philanthropists, it probably just gets recycled. For the banks, they get to have made a loan. It, uh, it's a working capital loan. Uh, to make it very real for you, uh, we recently announced a project here in Massachusetts. We raised $18 million. Nine of it came from Goldman Sachs. Um, and the other half of it came from various philanthropists. The Goldman Sachs part was a, f a loan at 5%. And uh, this allowed us to uh, partner with an organization called ROCA. ROCA is an extraordinary organization led by a woman named Molly Baldwin. For 25 years, they've worked with gang-involved youth. 
and it's a very intensive program. They go into neighborhoods, they grab kids by their earlobes, they say, you know what, you're terrible at selling drugs. Uh, I got a better idea. Why don't you, why don't you all come around and Roca, we'll see what we can do. And uh, they have shown, you know, these kids who are emerging from the juvenile justice system, incredibly, 62% of them, historically, are in prison within five years. 62%. ROCA has shown that they can bring that down to the low 20s. And the cost of ROCA is less than the savings to government if kids are not in that hotel that we call prison. And so what we have here is an, a financial feedback loop that's not just did the program work, but also did the program save government more money than the cost of the program itself? And, and that's a bit of a breakthrough, right? Because that says this is an investment opportunity. The well, government is absolutely terrible, though, about investing for things that may or may not happen in the future, and that's where the private folks come in. They'll say, well, we'll give you a money-back guarantee. Uh, you don't have to pay a penny until this thing already has worked, at which point you will have saved more than we're asking you to pay us. So you'll never have this feeling of uh, having spent more money than you actually have in your pocket government. Uh, and so that's how that works. So we uh, will be serving about a thousand young men over the next six or seven years and there'll be another thousand who randomly are not served by the program. Depending on the results, the state will pay as much as 27 million dollars in pay for success rewards. If they, if the program is successful and they do pay these rewards, We'll be able to repay the bank loans. And then any surpluses in this program will be available to be recycled going forward. So that the program, if it is successful, will, in a natural sense, it'll grow the way uh, things grow in the rest of our economy. Success allows you to make profits, and those profits get reinvested. Uh, the difference here is that it's, it's all in the nonprofit world. So no one's allowed to take the profits and put them in their pocket. Instead, it just gets reinvested into the future growth of a successful program. Now, if the program is not successful, you don't have those profits, those surpluses, and so that kind of atrophies away. And my belief is that's how you unfreeze the cryogenically frozen social sector and start marching down that path of uh, continuous improvement that we've seen um, in, in other areas. Uh, without going in, into details, there's a fairly wide range of issues where this pay for success approach can be applied. There are really areas where you can measure outcomes and where those outcomes, uh, there's a flavor of prevention in the work that you do. And if you can prevent it, it saves taxpayers money. Also, of course, improves the lives of the people that we're serving. Uh, and if you can have that, and there are a lot of those out there. It's certainly not a panacea, but we are finding that there are a lot of opportunities to do this type of, uh, of investing. And around the country, I don't know how well you can read this slide, but we have about um, 15 of these projects in development currently. Uh, we're excited. Just yesterday, we were uh, awarded a contract. Well, we were awarded the right to negotiate a contract with the state of Illinois. Uh, that was another, uh, in that case, it's diversion from prison sentences for kids. But we're working in other areas as well, uh, the early education, investments in early education as a way to avoid special education expenses and improve outcomes for kids. Uh, <coughs> asthma, we have a project in asthma. We have several projects in the uh, foster care area where, for example, uh, finding stable homes for mothers makes it possible to reunify those mothers with their kids in a safe environment. And we thought it was a homelessness project, but when we looked at the economics, it's actually a foster care project. So we're, it seems bizarre in the government world, but we're actually getting the foster care system to pay for our homelessness intervention, which is uh, kind of a first. Um, looking at the clock, I'm going to stop there and uh, open, open the field for questions. Yes, sir. Um, looking at your project list um, and your areas where you believe you can have an impact, one area you don't mention is K to 12 education. Right. 
Can you talk a little bit, bit about that? Sure. K to 12. He asks, what about K to 12 education? Um, I absolutely believe we're going to find a, something within K to 12 that works uh, under this model. Uh, already in Utah, there's one project that's brushing on that uh, in the sense that the success in the K to one, K to third grade is going to be used to pay for pre-K programs. If the pre-K programs can effectively get kids more ready to learn, that means there'll be lower special education and there'll be less uh, grade repeats. And that money in Utah is, is going to be plowed back into the pre-K system. I personally, I would love to do one in dropout production. And this one's kind of counterintuitive because you say, well, if you reduce dropouts, doesn't that increase costs for the schools? I mean, more kids will be in schools. And that's quite true. But then when you get into the, the world of government, there are two things. First is, yeah, if more kids are in schools for a city or a county, that means more money is sent to them by the state. And they actually feel their pockets filling uh, because the money that's sent to them is uh, kind of the average cost of the student, but the marginal cost of a new student is lower. So it's hard to be nerdy. Uh, the other thing that's more profoundly true, though, is that if you get kids off the street, that means they're probably savings over in the justice area. And, and probably those kids long term are going to succeed more, uh, have jobs and pay taxes. And so we're working on, um, on building those actuarial actuarial connections uh, to see if we can we can build project in K to 12. Haven't done it yet, but I hope we will. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the investors? As, as I understood it at this point, it was mostly philanthropists that were funding this because the banks couldn't really see the returns yet. Yeah. So you mentioned banks and philanthropists. <laughs> so she, she asks, um, what about the investors? I had heard it's only philanthropists because this is too scary for a bank. And I know we're sitting here with Enterprise Bank, and I'm sure they could say, yes, this is very scary for a bank. <coughs> um, so a couple things to say to that. Actually, no, the banks have been the easiest so far to bring to these projects uh, for a couple reasons. One is that we've structured the projects such that the philanthropists are in a what's called a first loss position. So they... If the project does kind of not so well, the philanthropists won't get to recycle their money anymore, but the bank's loans will still be protected. But here's the other thing, and this is an exciting development that's going on kind of at the <laughs> national level. The banks are doing this, and this is Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch, you know, big, big banks are, have been just pounding down our doors on this. They're doing this in part for PR, but that's not really the heart of why they're doing this. They're doing this because the families, the high net worth families they serve are asking for it. And their mentality is, you know, if there's some hundred millionaire who says to me, you know, I'd love to do something quasi philanthropic here. I want to return, but I want to put, you know, I'd like to make this investment just like any other, knowing that it's a little scary for me. Uh, we can make friends that way and then maybe I'll bring the other 99 million the old-fashioned way. So it's a, it is a way for banks to engage with high net worth families uh, that they hope will lead to deeper relationships uh, in the old-fashioned way. I actually believe, though, that the real answer is, you know, in these early days, yes, these are very speculative. But quite soon, the ones that worked will show themselves to have worked, and they'll no longer be as risky, at which point they will be uh, mainstream investable. Yes, Alex. But what about the ongoing role of those stakeholders in actually supporting the project that they're invested in? I, I would think that you would have people um, who are committed to doing this who would actually, in effect, want to be um, like trustees or overseers or, or you know, friendly you know, consultants to the people actually trying to manage that. Is there an ongoing role for right. those people? He asked about the ongoing role uh, on these projects on, and, and oversight. And uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, we're taking a, a page from the book of public finance in general. Uh, if anyone builds a highway, there are investors and there's a project management function and investors want to keep abreast of things and they, they'll stay out of your hair. Uh, unless things are seriously derailed. 
at which point they have certain rights and privileges to say, okay, you need to hire a consultant. <laughs> or if things are going very, very poorly, they say we have the right to shut this project down. And so a lot of the work that we have done as an intermediary at Third Sector Capital Partners, because we're kind of, we, we, we joke, we say that we're square dance instructors, you know, and one of the, and it's a new dance, so we have to actually invent the dance too. And part of this dance is laying out what we call triggers and remedies. What, what is the definition of seriously off the rails? At what point, what's the threshold that allows the investors to say, you know what, we're not going to shell out any more investment because it's scientifically clear that this could never work. Uh, and, and so that's all part of this innovation. There's a lot of kind of technology, if you will, uh, that's required to, to get this project management to, to work and to, to make the right trade-offs between uh, kind of decision rights. You have the states, the state has decision rights, the provider has decision rights, community members are at the table, and uh, the financiers are also there. Yes, Alex. It's yeah. just a follow-up, um, but it's, it's from the other end. So some of these programs um, already have uh, government um, rules and, and rights and, and the idea that you know if you fit a certain profile to enter a social service program, you kind of have an entitlement to the service, yes. uh, depending on, on what it might be. So how do you deal with the issue of yeah. the randomization? So one of the, the toughest, yeah. one of the toughest questions he's asking about how do you do randomization in a world of entitlements, and this is true of uh, social sciences grapple with this all the time. Uh, we happen and we and we're taking each project one at a time. Uh, we designed an approach for Roca where there is no denial of service, no matter what. If someone if someone in the control group shows up at Roca's doorstep, Roca doesn't even know they're in the control group and they have absolutely the right to serve those individuals. Now, in order for that to work on a practical level, two things had to be true. One is we had to be budget constrained, which we are, which means we can't serve everyone. So we might as well randomize, you know, that makes it easier to randomize if ethically you can't serve everybody anyway. Uh, but the other thing is that because they will have a certain number of kids from the control group that they're serving, um, that quote unquote contaminates the study a little bit and that meant that we had to grow by a factor of two pretty much the number of kids we serve in order to get a good scientific read of the impact. And that's the social scientists are, are quite good at kind of designing uh, these things that way. There are other statistical methods that can be used too that, uh, that avoid denial of service. That, they're called, uh, you know, regression discontinuity studies, and there, uh, there's a, just a whole actuarial science that's <laughs> being unveiled now that deals with that question of the counterfactual. And the word the counterfactual is a fancy way of saying what would have happened in the absence of this program. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, JD. George, can you talk in a little more detail about the early ed program in Salt Lake City? Sure. So, uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, there's an ex-banker named Janice Dubno, who, who you know, I think, or you, you may have met Janice uh, in your Ready Nation role. Uh, Janice uh, moved to Utah six or seven years ago and started working with kids in a school district called the Granite School District. And um, she found this wonderful pre-K program and what they discovered, or what she was able to show laboriously by collecting data and demonstrating it, is that when they work with these kids, a much smaller percentage of the kids end up in special ed. And the reason is because there's a, a test that the kids take when they're very young, just entering into pre-K, which is highly indicative of whether or not they'll end up in special education. And she was able to show that when the kids make progress on this test through their pre-K experience, those who make progress on the test in the end don't end up in special ed. Then she laboriously figured out the economics. She met with the school district and the mayor and, and everybody, and she was able to show that the savings in the special ed actually were larger than the cost of this program. So turn the clock forward, it's, it's Herculean task, but she put together a deal that involved uh, J.B. Pritchard and Goldman Sachs and the uh, Salt Lake City 
and, uh, and also the state of Utah. And it's one of these things where they're going to count what the reduction is in special ed and essentially share a percent of the savings as a way to plow back into, that, into the pre-K. And in the meantime, the banks are going to pay for the program while they wait for that stream of, um, of uh, performance-driven proceeds to come their way. Yes? I have a question for you on that program. You're replacing or changing an existing protocol, correct? The, uh, you're, you're talking about Utah or, yes. or at, at Roca? Yeah, uh, I'm talking about what you're doing in Utah. In Utah, yeah. It's not our project, so I'm not going to be deeply expertise on it, but go, go ahead. Do the parents have anything to do with the selection process? And if they do, yeah. do you have a random sample? Yeah, so um, I don't want to uh, say more than I know about because I didn't do that project, but uh, that one's different. That one doesn't have randomization. The way that one works is all the kids are being pre-tested at the beginning, and they are asserting that if a kid shows up at preschool with a test score this low, then they are destined. We're just going to say, we know already that that kid has a 70% chance of going into special education. So they're going to take all those kids who had that pretest, and they're going to ask, is it less than 70% of these kids who end up in special education? Well, ask yes. a different way. Yeah. If you are, in fact, a prison program or an education program, yeah. changing an existing practice, somebody's got to volunteer for that to be a subject, whether they be control yeah. or actual. Yeah. Does that, does that yeah. Is that selection bias? Yeah. Right so the gentleman's getting into the science of how do you measure outcomes. And, you know, a lot of people um, talk about the gold standard of measuring outcomes is randomization. I don't think that's the gold standard. Uh, to me, the gold standard of re measuring outcomes is do you deal effectively with the counterfactual? Do you have an effective way of being able to say, were it not for this program, <laughs> here's what would have happened with these kids as compared to what actually has happened. In some cases, you don't need to do anything actuarial. Let, let me give an example. We are um, about to embark on a project in Illinois where the judges are sending a kid up the river. And the program is to say, how about instead of up the river, he goes, back into the community with the following supports that are paid for philanthropically. And let's then look at the recidivism rates of this thing. And so that's a situation where uh, we, we don't have randomization going on. But uh, you're zeroing in right on why uh, probably only two times in 10 situations can this type of pay for success technology be used. Because there's so many situations where randomization just can't be done for ethical reasons or for practical reasons. This is not a panacea, it, but it, it works quite well in certain areas. Yes? What's, what's the overhead involved in measuring the outcome? Yeah. What's the overhead in measuring the outcome? One of my favorite questions. So um, in these early projects, um, you know, we have this uh, $27 million of uh, outcome, or of payments here in Massachusetts. I don't have the exact number. <laughs> I want to say it's something like $2 million or so uh, that's tied to project management and, and evaluation. And then there are other overheads. The overheads are high, particularly in the early days. They will go down. In particular, what's making this all possible is the uh, administrative data that's available that has vastly reduced the cost of doing these uh, evaluations. So, you know, tip I had a conversation with someone from one of the large evaluation firms. You know, that's a big industry, Mathematica and uh, Apt Associates and, um, well, there are several of them. Now, one of them said, you know, George, we can't have this conversation. I am not permitted to have a conversation with someone about a new project unless it's at least a million dollars. I said, we, we can't afford that. Well, it turns out that we've been able to find $100,000 dollar 
ways of doing this because we're using existing databases. Raj Chetty, that gentleman from Harvard, the 12 year old with the MacArthur Genius Award, I asked him, I said, my goodness, that's the Manhattan Project of social research. How much did that cost? And he said, oh yeah, it was expensive. Uh, we tallied it all up. It was $112,000 that we spent on this thing. And so this is the breakthrough. And he, by the way, he's getting a movie as opposed to a snapshot. I asked Raj, well, you know, we have 2,000 kids for our ROCA thing. If I sent them to you three or four or five years from now, could you tell me how much these kids are earning by pinging it against the, uh, the tax database? He says, oh, yeah. I said, wow, how, how much is that going to cost? He says, well, it's going to take me about two hours to do it. So there's a revolution, a scientific revolution in our ability to have a, uh, a computerized feedback loop on what's working and what isn't working. Yes, Neil. Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting to me about this is how you've managed to help the, the, the people who, who are, the problems that are going to be avoided, help fund in areas that are not sort of necessarily the places they're going to be, the special ed people in the, in the K through 12 system that are funding early childhood. And it seemed to me that many of the issues that you, that you said you could address are things that ultimately if, if there had been more intervention in these children's lives at an earlier age, might have been presentable problems. Do you think that, that generally speaking, a lot of this ultimately will wind up generating more support for early childhood interventions of many kinds? So he's asking, does this lend itself really for prevention? And, and there are really two tricks that government is particularly not very good at. I mean, certainly governments cryogenically freeze things. But government is also not good at spending money on stuff that may or may not yield results four or five years from now. You know, it's not a good political strategy to say, yes, I spent a lot and I have nothing to show for it. <laughs> so that the next person says, well, look at these great results. I didn't have to spend any. So that, this thing helps to address that problem by saying, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs will, will pay for it, or philanthropists will pay for it, and uh, you get to kind of tout that with people. Um, also, it turns out that often prevention has good economics. You know, a stitch in time saves nine, as the saying goes. But there's a, so that's one dimension. The other thing that government is really not good at is to have one agency write a check to another agency. So this idea of funding homelessness work using foster care savings, that is something that, that's not a trick government's going to do itself. But, you know, we joke, we can, we as an intermediary, we can go to the foster care system and say, how would you like us to reduce the average length of stay by a lot for hundreds and hundreds of mothers? And they'll say, yeah, we'd, we'd like that. Will you share some of your savings? Sure, we'll share some of your savings. And then they say, well, how are you going to do that? And we can say, don't even ask us, are you willing to share? And then we go and we talk to the homelessness people and we say, is it okay if we purchase some services helping these mothers? They don't, it's like one, one agency doesn't need to know about the other agency. I mean, in practice, they totally know about it because we can't be good stewards for these communities unless there's you know, strong communication throughout. But in principle, this intermediary role is making it possible to affect interagency transfers of money, which is really exciting for those who uh, study policy. Yes? Even the polarization of government today, what kind of a bedfellow do they make for you? <laughs> Given the polarization of government, what kind of a bedfellow do they make? Ah, well, one, one of the benefits of this approach, if you think about it, you know, historically, investing in social areas was always kind of on one end of the spectrum and saving money fiscally was at the other end of the spectrum. You had to choose. This thing is politically marvelous in the sense that the same program will both address a social program in an innovative way, a social issue, and it saves money. So we're finding that it's a big time political winner. The, uh, the thing that's harder is just working it's kind of the death by a thousand lashes. You have to get so much behavior change. You know, as I was joking before, we are square dance instructors, and we have 
hundreds of dancers that need to change their dance. And, you know, just let's take Roca. We need the probation department to randomly refer people. That's a new trick. And we have to do that with the Department of Youth Services. That's a new trick. We have to negotiate the data sharing agreements with them. That's a new trick. We have to negotiate the data sharing agreement with them. That's a new trick. They have to have a negotiation between the two of them. That's yet another trick. So it's in, in that sense, cutting through all the cobwebs, it, it's extremely hard work. Uh, but once that work is done, you know, we've got a new system, which is very exciting. I, I think I, I see the hook there. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll. Last question. Yes. Uh, I'm one of those social scientists that appreciate the big picture, the big data picture, but I still have one foot grounded in that, that world of, of data collection that's on the individual case study. Yes. Do you have feedback mechanisms built into these programs that allow you to collect data from the individual participants yeah. to help refine? So it's such a great question. What about um, collecting data from individuals versus, you know, this rather antiseptic approach that we're using? Did the needle move or not? pay no attention to why it moved. And um, one of the things that we say over and over again is we are creating this needle machine. It is not attempting to ask the question, why did the needle move? In fact, what it is doing is creating an incentive for people to want it answer the question, why did the needle move? So paradoxically, even though we're talking about these low cost ongoing rather uh, narrowly focused evaluations uh, to, to be the backbone of these projects, I believe that they will give rise to greater demand for the more diagnostic evaluations that get inside the machinery, that get right there into what, it, what truly is taking place internally at an organization such that the needle moves. So that's, that's yet another exciting uh, part of the whole, uh, the whole innovation. So I guess we're out of time. Thank you very much, everybody. It's uh, been a conversation.